Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Brittany Adeline King, and I'm the curatorial assistant here at White Collins. It's a pleasure to welcome you all to tonight's talk featuring Sean D. Henry Smith, Sasha Fires Briggs, and Camila Chinat Rashid, moderated by Ayana Dozier. This is the fourth and final event in a series of online talks and readings organized on the occasion of Sean's exhibition in awe of geometry and mornings, which closes today at White Collins. The exhibition brings together a selection of photographs drawn from Henry Smith's most recent book, Wild Peach, which was published by Future Poem this past fall. A special thank you to Sean for working with us here at White Collins and organizing what's been such an incredible series of events. Also a special thank you to Ayana, Camila, and Sasha, who will be joined by tonight. Ayana Dozier, PhD, is a writer, lecturer, curator, and artist working at the intersection of film, photography, and performance. She recently received her PhD from the Department of Art History and Communication Studies at McGill University. She is the author of Janet Jackson's The Velvet Rope 2020 and was a 2018, 2019 Helena Rubenstein Fellow in Critical Studies at the Whitney Independent Studies Program. Her most recent film installation, Cities of the Dead, will premiere at The Shed as a part of their open call exhibition in summer of 2021. Sasha Fires Burgess is a photographer who is, investigates notions of home and family, especially as those concepts play out for first generation American born to Trinidadian parents. Camila Janan Rashid, um, born in East Palo Alto, California, grapples with the poet, poetics, politics, and pleasures of the unfinished and uncontained. She is invested in black storytelling and technologies that invite us to consider ways of unlearning that are dis interdisciplinary, interspecies, and interstellar. Engaging primarily with text, Rashid works across different subtraits and compositional fields. She works on the page, on walls, and in public spaces to create associative arrangements of letters, words, and shapes that invite an embodied and, uh, sorry, embodied and ir irative reading process. She is the author of two artist books, An Alphabetical Accumulation of Approximate Observations, which came out with Endless Editions in 2019, and No New Theories, which came out with Printed Matter in 2019. With that being said, thank you all again for tuning in tonight. I'm now going to turn it over to Sean. Well, thank you. And wow, um, I'm, I'm just so glad that we're all here. Um, yeah, it's it's um, really special that this is the um, last event and, and the last day of the show, um, and um, I'm just really excited. Um, oh, I'm already in the position of thinking about all that has transpired in the last. I think it's been six weeks, um, and in the resonances that have kind of come across um, the other gatherings and um, and this conversation feels a little bit different in that um, it's not so much the like round table of like reading and kind of performing and talking that um, um, the others have been and I, I and um, it you know Dr. Dozier will be taking over and, and kind of um, ushering a conversation about all of our our works and and, and including hers and I think that's um, if anything that is maybe the through line is that um, all of the events have brought together artists who work in many modes and 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 um, and sometimes that role is curating or editing or it's writing or performing or photographing or bookmaking and um, I think actually, you know, when I think of um, the artists that I'm, I've always been looking to and, and, and in fact, maybe even the ones that I don't know yet, um, um, I think that maybe the thing that is like sort of like uniquely um, consistent in all Black art practices is this kind of multi-genre and multimodal practice. Um, even if it's a private practice, um, I, I think that's you know um, just as important, um, and it, and it really informs the way that we all work and the ways that we do. Um, and I'm I'm just excited about tonight. Um, so thank you all for agreeing to be here tonight. 
Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for the invitation to participate. Um, and I think actually I'm gonna jump off of what you just said uh, to then think critically about the notions of like discipline, right? And disciplinary tactics. Uh, and I guess to, to link that through, I remember often being, um, I wouldn't say punished, uh, but reprimanded by uh, my professors uh, as I kind of originally started in art history, uh, then I moved on to like critical theory and they just kind of said, you know, you're just doing too much um, and you gotta like pick a lane. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I think oftentimes I internalized that earlier on in my career as being that I was scattered, I was disorganized um, and I was wayward. And I got that a lot. I got wayward as a, as a criticism. Um, and it took me a while before I, I, I realized that there's something's really useful in being wayward, right? Especially as a black subject in which disciplinary structures uh, beyond the academy, but literally disciplinizing our bodies on the street uh, within an institution, our workplace, et cetera, um, are always trying to correct us. Like we're, we need to kind of bend to a certain uh, form. And so waywardness uh, is almost a kind of expressive possibilities of like expansion, right? Of possibility of a of difference of alterity um, of a kind of self-making practice uh, that exceeds uh, all of these institutional confines or conditions in which the disciplined body is is paramount. But of course, the disciplined body needs to become exemplified through the black body. And so with that being said, um, throughout my own practice, and I was kind of listening to all of our, our bios and across all the many things that we all do. And of course, I was really immersed over the last like four days, just taking in your guys' work and like reading everything that everyone else has said about you, um, looking at your guys' shows and just seeing just how uh, this notion of a kind of singularity is, is not applicable to your guys' practice um, and how that interdisciplinary, if not multidisciplinary practice also becomes rooted as a kind of, uh, as a, as a, an example, right, of, of Black struggle. Um, and what I mean by that is that it's all the ways in which Blackness within an institution, within the arts for this conversation, um, has to be understood. And we might want to, and we can say more about this, but we might want to think about Glissant's the right for opacity here, right? Um, and critically, what he, he calls for, it's not that it's opacity with regards to, you know, confusion or being obliquely uh, opaque, but no, that actually under the conditions of Western society, Euro-American methods of, of thought making, of disciplinizing people, right? That there isn't a clear vocabulary. There isn't a field of knowledge that can actually attest to blackness as a human element, right? For its humanity. So the right to opacity is a call saying that you cannot know me through the methodologies that you've been trained to know things in this world. And in that respect, one must exceed the discipline, one must become undisciplined, one must become multidisciplinary in their tactics in order to kind of approach blackness uh, as, as a struggle. And I don't mean that in a pejorative, I mean that as something that we don't not yet fully know in this world because we haven't been fully equipped with materials to do so. And so finding out all of those different disciplines, becoming wayward, right? Uh, taking the less beaten path is how we start to accumulate uh, a body of work to, to be able to interpret blackness uh, within our own lives, within our own bodies, but also make it a kind of uh, a felt practice in society. Um, and I just want to, you know, drifting off of what Sean beautifully laid us out with, I want to kind of throw that back to you guys, right? Um, what are the own ways in which waywardness became a, a critical path, right? Where you guys were perhaps able to do that work of understanding, I need to become undisciplined, right? I need to exceed the conditions of disciplinary uh, structures here because they're not serving me in this in this way. Mm 
this is that weird moment where you're trying to figure out who's going first by facial expressions. Um, <laughs> I'll hop in um, and just like speak anecdotally. And then I want to like also be attuned to speaking to like a lineage of black women who have like helped me think through this. Um, I think anecdotally at 35, um, I am in the middle of like relearning the basics of physics um, and relearning a bunch of stuff because there are ways in which my academic upbringing did not allow for that convergence, even when I was intent um, on that convergence being something real. And I feel like now at 35, I have the language to be able to say like, no, physics is like inextricably connected to how I understand blackness. Uh, physics is inextricably connected to how I understand what a circle can and can't do and why a circle and orbiting and circumambulation is central to how I understand the world, right? And so, um, and thinking about that, I didn't have a website for like three or four years because I uh, was constantly being told that I need to have like a clear statement about what I do in the world. Like I need to have a, like a, like five sentences that are like, Kiwa does this. Um, and when you read, when the bio was read, I did have it. That took me like five or six years to get to, but I finally got there. And the statement was actually not a statement of what I do, but a statement is literally a statement of unfinishedness, right? Like what I'm interested in is thinking about the generative qualities of something not being finished and thinking about blackness as a mode of being in the world that is unfinished and uncontained. And therefore for me to assert uh, any particular fixedness um, is doing a disservice to myself and to other black folks. And so, um, and thinking about that, I, I ended up writing this essay about my work, which was just ended up being an essay about interdisciplinary practice. Um, and I came across this Lucille Clifton poem uh, called I'm Not Done Yet from 1974. And one of the things she says in the poem, um, I was like about to like get nervous, start crying. One of the things she says in the poem is that she's as imminent as bread, mm -hmm. um, as possible as yeast. And I was sitting here thinking, I was like, damn, Lucille Clifton just wrote my artist statement for me. And she did it in 1974. I've been doing all this work trying to figure it out for the last six years and she did it. Right. Um, and that became a central part of like my meditation of thinking about what does it mean to be as possible as geese, as as eminent as bread, like this, this notion of, of eminency. Um, and so when I think about interdisciplinary practice, uh, for me, what it does is it opens up this sort of valve to sort of think about the relationships between many things, because as as black folks, as humans, we are connected. Um, across many fields, across many species, across many forms of like living and non-living. And so um, that's where a lot of my thinking has been. And I just like wanna shout out black women because I think a lot of this work around thinking about interdisciplinary connections, this notion of like the freedom that comes from being, um, be participating and asserting your own undoing or undoneness. Um, I think about um, Octavia Butler, who talks about primitive hypertext, this notion of, of sort of like allowing herself to float through many texts. I think about Catherine Rich Kittrick, of course, who talks about this all the time. Um, I think about Alexis Pauline Gums, who talks about this notion of being kindred beyond taxonomy, or this notion of like an ancestry co-written text, this notion that we're all in connection, but more importantly, we're constantly trying to figure out things. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's where, I think that's where I'm in. I'm like looking at these notes because you mentioned something around disciplining uh, bodies and it made me think about choreography, which I'm not a great dancer, but I'm really interested in choreography, which also made me think about protocols, which then made me think about lesson planning as a high school teacher. I used to be a history uh, teacher for high school students and all the work that we do to discipline the way that people think about connections between the world. As a social studies teacher, I'm not teaching math. So even if I come across a unit about that's related to math, I'm not teaching that, right? And so the ways in which this uh, forcing of folks to think about the world in this unilateral way um, begins at a very early age. Um, and I guess the last thing I will say um, is I'm also thinking about Gwendolyn Brooks when she talks about uh, we occur everywhere and me thinking about this notion of indeed we occur everywhere, then why will we be contained to one discipline? Uh, what can a discipline do to hold like they it can't hold us right a book can't hold us we constantly need to be in the process of cultural production and i was in a text message uh conversation with a friend where she was giving a list of statistics like 54 percent of black people 17 percent of women and 18 percent of like poor and i was like we are a simultaneous people the notion that you broke down these statistics as like women black people then women then this other thing mm. just removes us from the context of being simultaneous um so yeah, I think my interdisciplinary is a simultaneity uh, that gives us life. And when you remove that simultaneity, it's a literary, a, a sort of a violence.
Wow. Yeah. I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, Sasha, would you like to go next? But there's obviously no pressure. Yeah, I'm just wondering where you are. You're muted, Sasha. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, you go ahead, Sean, if you wanted to go. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm, well, the, one of the, the things I kind of wanted to echo off, uh, Camila, was thinking, I, I'm, I mean, probably definitely nowhere as, as in depth as you, but I've also been sort of reteaching myself some science and physics in particular. Um, and, um, and yeah, again, like truly just watching like crash courses on YouTube and like trying to make sense of it. But, um, but I, 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 uh, I'd encountered today, um, I'd, I'd actually just started watching Nation Time, um, the William Greaves film, um, and, um, the, the, I was reminded, um, I was talking about it with a friend who, and I was reminded um, by him that um, Symbiopsychotaxoplasm, um, his film was influenced by his thinking on the first law of thermodynamics, which is energy as never um, created or destroyed, uh, it can only change. Um, and the first event with Elliot, um, Justin and, and uh, Kiara, um, was titled "Never Created, Never Destroyed," and 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 it just it just kind of brought me into this sort of circle of like, oh, maybe this is sort of like the the like container of um, of of these gatherings is 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 just you know, even though we aren't like physically in the same place right now, there's still like a through line, and there's still like a conversation and sort of these energetic connections that are like happening in this way, um, and. And and I think that's like necessarily wayward, you know. Like it's it, it's like you know we, we're in um, a moment of like we we can't be in a convention center right now, you know. Uh, I, I was list, list watching it with my headphones in and 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 just literally hearing a room full of black people like clapping, um, like brought me to tears. And I was just like, whoa! Like I I I I, I like miss that sound. I like miss being around us and, and like loudly. Um, and that is like. And, and and sort of because of, you know, disciplinary measures, that is, like, inherently wayward. And also because of many of, yeah, sorry. So that's just kind of where I'm, like, entering um, uh, this sort of, like, line of questioning. And I, I'm also, um, you know, I, I, when I, when I, I I'm, I'm always, always, always um, thinking about, Nervese Philip and the, the the story that cannot be told, um, and I think in the story's impossibility, um, it, it it's it's also sort of calling for like every tool at hand, and so it's it's like yes, it's the sort of like historical research, and then there's the poetics, and then there's the uh, collective and collaborative like mourning you know and 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 um and sort of making a new um and honoring and i and i um and that happens in song and in dance and you know through our visual mediums and and through our collective efforts in feeding each other and making home for each other and um again these sort of like both public and private practices and 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 yeah and in a lot of ways just kind of like holding that as like the the task at hand it's like what um i think like makes me do anything you know um yeah yeah, yeah i think <laughs> no it's all really good um i'm gonna get it over uh hand it over to sasha in a second um but i'm also just thinking based on what camila and you just mentioned sean around uh uh mr bessie phillips's uh how i became a spy um, mm -hmm. And how I've, in my own work, I've been thinking more through like spy as a as a language, as a kind of possibility, as a uh, as a figure to inhabit, rather than like the fugitive that's taken hold as a kind of popular figure uh, to describe uh, blackness in the institution. 
Um, and, and we can say more about that. Uh, you know, I don't know where you guys stand on fugitivity uh, as a concept, as a metaphor, um, but I was just thinking of, of and also thinking to what Camila stated, you know, shouting out black women, right? Um, black studies is black feminism uh, and black studies in all its radical possibilities, you know, someone kind of coming intimately from that academic position would be nothing <laughs> without black women scholars and black literary feminist practices and the stuff that they carved out for us in the sixties and seventies um, with Alice Walker, with uh, Gwendolyn Brooks's work and even before then with uh, Polly Marshall's work. Uh, it it mm -hmm. rests so critically on that. And so kind of returning to this position of becoming the spy um, and even how Alexis Pauline Gums takes that up in her own work. Uh, is, is something that I've been attuned to and also thinking of how you guys are both coming back to physics, right? Um, and in my own, uh, my di dissertation defense, I went on a tangent and started talking about astrophysics and my like advisory, advisory committee was like, what is she doing? But I, I felt like it was necessary to use every tool available to me to think about time and uh, specifically how we perceive time um, and how we cannot utilize just one singular language to do something that has been so totalizing uh, in crafting uh, and against, uh, against blackness, specifically black feminists, black uh, womanhood and all its possibilities. Um, so those are just some points that are just immediately jumping to my mind, but uh, Sasha, um, I, I kind of want to give you a space to think about waywardness and, and any, anything I've just mentioned as well. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm going to go back to the original question just because I was thinking about that, but then I really am also quite interested in this question of fugit fugitivity. But the original question around interdisciplinary, I really liked, I really liked both some of the things that Camila and Sean were saying, specifically what Camila said about the fact that, um, like the way that we're taught school it, it's separate, and I think one of the it, one of the problems with European ways of thinking, because it's essentially the way that we learn in school is like a European construct, is that it has this separateness. But once you get older and you begin to learn things as a black person from a black point of perspective, you begin to realize that like yeah, I am as imminent as yeast. I am I am the dark matter in the sky. I'm like the fibers of the carpet, shit like that. You know what I'm saying? That's just really just that is presented to you underneath the school setting in a really kind of like this is this and this is that kind of way you know what I'm saying like there's no um it really just kind of comes down to the thought as being the primary action and then the being as being secondary but I think that uh what the interesting thing and when you start learning about science and physics and when you're thinking specifically about black people um, their transit through world history, all that kind of stuff. You have to kind of like understand in which the laws of physics quite literally made uh, made the, tra the, the, the traveling of black people to the Americas possible. So we cannot distinguish ourselves from the physical history that it, you know what I'm saying? Like, I think it's really weird the way that we learn things in school separately, even bits of history, bits of math, bits of this, it's kind of like, oh, we learned like X, Y, Z thing happened. And then over here, another thing was happening, but it's like, actually everything was kind of like, there was no one without the other. It was all in a dialogue with each other. So that being said, I think that makes sense why as we move away, ideally from European ways of thought, things like interdisciplinary practices are just more common. That being said, I do think that there is something to be said for people that are practitioners of a certain art very intensely. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think that that can be really awesome. But I think the fact that now that there's, uh, now, that now that the focus of attention is shifting, that like, um, so is the practice, like the pra people's practices are shifting and yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think what that reminds me of um, is, and it's pulling from not only what you just said, Sasha, but what Camila mentioned and what Sean kind of got us to as well, is 
that these are all interconnected narratives, right? And, you know, yes, Blackness as a kind of global population, um, or even specifically, let's, you know, think about the United States is like 16%. Um, mm -hmm. But every element, right, within how we come to know ourselves is conditioned upon anti-Blackness, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, it's what Horton Spillers argues, right? That when we come to understand knowledge, like how do we understand existence, that ontological relationship, it is forged through anti-Blackness. And so rather than thinking yeah. of Blackness as the margins that were like so outside of these institutions, we're actually at the center of all of the ways in which these institutions come to know themselves because they come to know themselves through anti-Blackness. Like I was just on this weird Twitter thread around the, the ice cream song, you know? I don't know if you guys know that history, uh, yeah, <laughs> but the song, yeah. you know, the, the ice cream truck, the da -da 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 -da, um, that song is racist. <laughs> and it's based on an old minstrel song uh, around uh, Black people eating watermelon, but they replaced it with ice cream. Like little things like that are, are just kind of take you back to that heart of how something is just forged through anti-Blackness. So it's critical to understand that, you know, at this moment of discovery and what Sasha was just talking about, if we want to go back to like physics and kind of sciences, at that moment of enlightenment, right, was the same moment of the transatlantic slave trade. That moment of the kind of, oh, we know how to read the stars to travel was also the same time in which they were uh, forging really horrific conditions of human subjugation. Um, and they're not disconnected. They are the same kind of thought in, in action to kind of create a field of study down the road. Um, with that being said, I, I want to uh, I want to think about this this relationship a bit more through the term ecology, um, and uh, I specify ecology here because one uh, in a lot of your guys' work, you guys either mention ecologies uh, around uh, being uh, and and interrelatedness, um, and or other critics have looked at your guys' work and been like the ecological relation. Um, and just for those in the audience who may not necessarily be familiar uh, uh, with that term, ecology defines how um, an organism, uh, so if we're thinking here of like the human body, right, exists within relationship within a specific environment, right? So it's all of those interconnected uh, exchanges between that organism and its surrounding placement. So if we think about the ecologies around blackness, right, um, that includes the institution, right, that includes uh, uh, other people, that includes uh, how we relate to people, like how do we uh, have friends, like it, those are all ecological conditions that are informed by some narrative around Blackness, largely anti-Blackness. Um, but I think, again, what your guys' work make possible is that shifting, that kind of new mode of crafting thought, uh, literally crafting a kind of new way of thinking in this world that is uh, filtered around the affirmation of Blackness, right? That exceeds what we came to know about ourselves in reality and builds a new methodology around affirming Blackness. Um, and so what kind of ecological relations can you start to think through in your own practices that come out of that uh, affirmation of Blackness, right? But not only just with like material, things like, you know, oh, I want to affirm my place within an institution, but, you know, let's get more meta with it, right? Like the, the material, the immaterial spirits. Um, in my own work, I talk about having relationships with ghosts, right? Like having, making kin with the ghost as your friend, um, as a supporter of your, of your career, as your ancestor that is like with you today. Um, but also I know again with Camila's work uh, and also with Sean's work, you know, what are the immaterial ecologies we can forge around like the stars, around the cosmologies, the cosmological levels um, and, and beyond. Yeah, um, um, I think, I think um, maybe a way in which like to me it, it best illustrates itself is um, in the photograph uh, Atlantic beckoning or just over your shoulder which is the um, the photograph of the sort of crashing waves on the rocks and then the sort of interruption of um, hair um, and and I and I, I, I think about it in the sort of like sort of on both sides of the exposure um, and so you know what I 
thought I was encountering in the frame wasn't what uh, the negative offered me. Um, largely in that I didn't know that um, my hair had fallen into the frame. And um, and I there was a there was I think in my sort of like first sort of dealing with it, I was just like, oh, this is a mistake. Um, oh my god. <laughs> Yes, that one. <laughs> um, wow. <laughs> Thank you. I, yours hasn't come yet. I can't wait to have yours in my hand. Uh, um, but um, and and I but I, I think in in uh, one I want to thank uh, Patrice Aphrodite Helmar for sort of speaking through that photograph with me, but. Um, but also, yeah, just kind of in my, like, sitting with it, I was just like, oh, like, actually that presence is very much beyond my own. And, um, and in sort of like my, like, notes or sort of like writing around the photograph, it is this sort of like, uh, encounter with a ghostly presence and like, and, and one in which you've, a, 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 like, you've arrived at a shore that you don't know and you're like looking back somewhere across you know um and um you know placing yourself where you are and also trying to place yourself where you were before um and and you haven't even turned around to face the landscape yet so it's just this sort of like immediate i, I you know I'm, I'm thinking about like literally land meeting water and then also like this this um with, I mean, like I'm trying. I guess I'm, I'm like I'm trying not to be heavy-handed with it. I guess, but you know, there is a, this sort of like transatlantic idea um, that's that's like being encountered, and so be heavy-handed. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I'm I'm I definitely think there's a sort of like, um, and especially in the the you know, I think this is actually consistent even with um, the photographs where there's like some form of animal or insect life um or even the photographs that might register as portraits that also don't you know in which there's this like yeah there's this meeting of like yes there we are where we literally are and that's important and we also are in this like unnameable space that's um you know sort of at, at the like meeting point of past and present um and like who we were before and who we are now and who we will be and who will see this afterward. You know, there's, um, yeah, there's a sort of like rupture and sort of it in capture in time that's, um, being thought through and, and, and played with. And, it, and on, yeah, Sasha, I'm thinking about, um, oh God, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking about the, the, I don't, I, I don't know the name of it, but the photograph, um, it, it, it's a, it's like a man in a backyard. It's like, I, I, I actually shared it in relationship to this event, but uh, he, he's like holding what looks to be like some kind of like engine or something. And he's like looking just over his shoulder. And there's something about that, like even just from this half of his face, there's this expression that I've seen across like so many of my elders and like um, neighbors or whatever, or, you know, and, and, and there's something about like the backyard, there's the, the crate, you know, the bucket where I just like, I immediately know where I am. And I'm also kind of like, and because of it, I'm like in many times of my, like, like I'm four years old and I'm visiting my, you know, family in Jamaica. And I'm also like 15 and arguing with my dad in my backyard, you know, in Miami. And then, the, you know, there's just like, I'm in many places and like, um, and in many kinds of moods. Um, and like, I, and I know that even in my memory of the instance that is your encounter, um, there are like many more that we can all sort of find in our own experiences and, and yeah, I'm just kind of like wrestling with this, like, uh, like repetition, um, that isn't like exactly the same, but there's the, you know, it, it's, it's like an echoing, you know? Um, uh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> 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 go go Sasha I, I was just gonna say something it's a perception of time right like um how do we perceive time um and how do we 
disagree with the linearity of mm -hmm. time that colonialism has told us. Mm -hmm. um, but Sasha, please. Um, yeah, I guess I think it's the, um, I think I'm trying to think specifically. So looking at your book, Sean, like I think I'm, I think I can think very specifically about photographs because I, that's maybe the language I understand the most, a, a little bit more. And I, I think maybe um, like Ayana and Camila and Sean, you all are also more um, people that are good with words. But the thing that I noticed about seeing the photographs in your book is like it, it takes me there because I understand that experience, I should say. And I don't know, I think that like, when you talk about that photograph of that's my uncle in his backyard, that's in Canada, you know what I mean? It's like, I think there's always this, this breadth of the black experience, the diaspora, that the black experience that is specific both to pe to people's cultures, which is like, you know, why am I in Canada? And also like have, like, I'm sure Sean and I have family in all the same places, Florida, Canada, England, you know what I mean? So yeah. it's like a very specific, like, and, and I don't know your uh, backgrounds as well, Ayana and, um, Camila, but you know, it's like a very, but they overlap and they overlap because of the, because of us being African descendants of us being black people. So I think that there's very specific language that of, of when we speak to each other through words and through that um, for a long time, because, you know, black people were not at the, um, people of African descendants, our voices were not at the forefront. We couldn't, be, we weren't speaking, we were speaking to each other in the same ways. I don't want to make that sound, but it's like, now we get to speak to each, each other in all these new ways. I don't know if I'm answering the question about ecologies, but it just makes me think like, when you see, um, when you see those images, when you're like, I know that, I know what that is. It's like you come into the backyard and your uncle's in the back. He's just like fucking in the yard. You don't even know what the hell he's doing. Like I, I was like trying to be cute about it. I'm just like, he's just digging a hole in the yard. You know what I'm saying? And like something happened earlier in the day and you're like, might be mad. And then he's just like, hey, come and da 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 ting. And you're like, Ugh. it's just like a certain language. I think that we get to speak to each other now. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, Sasha, so much. Uh, thank you so much for building that bridge because I was trying to find the language as well. You just like gave it uh, to me, which is like this sense of familiarity um, that you can't actually place. Um, so there's like this extreme comfort and joy that comes from that familiarity. Like I know that, but then on the flip side, I think there's an extreme. Um, I'll speak for myself. An extreme sense of like, anger um, and frustration around that familiarity, which is like. It feels familiar because it's linked to something that maybe we who have common ancestors have done at a past point, but I can't name the thing that is the thing that feels familiar because I don't have access, right? And so for me, I'm always trying to grapple with like um, that like edge of familiarity, which feels very, very good, uh, but at the same time, it feels very, very terrible. Um, and just like, and I keep thinking about haunting um, a lot because there's a lot of ways in which I think about that familiarity as like this haunting, right? This, this notion of something sort of like looking over your shoulder, but you can't actually name the thing or be able to make sense of the thing, but you know the thing is there. Um, and I think on the comfort side, I'm also reminded that there's something beautiful about like not naming things and like letting things just be what they are, right? So I think there is something about the way that Western knowledge production and uh, legitimacy works, which is like, I'm able to name the thing, I'm able to give it a category, I'm able to put it into a taxonomical structure and therefore it is a thing, but there's something uh, I think beautiful about not being able to capture what we're talking about, right? Someone coming and watching this later, well, what the hell, there's something about a backyard and the ant, like what are, what are they, uh, you still can't capture it. And so I think back to Ayana's uh, had asked about fugitivity before, I'm really interested in like, the opportunity for fugitivity to sort of like have an mm -hmm. insular private experience that only some people have access to and that being, um, really wonderful. And I have like this large collection of black and photographs I've been collecting for like 
like a decade and they're like 4,000 now and I haven't done anything with them except I had a couple exhibits with them uh, but they're haunting because they're extremely familiar and I collected them specifically because there's a girl in a yellow dress and I have a, I have a picture of myself in a yellow dress and I'm standing in a similar location so these like these I think someone mentioned echoing and repetition there's like this doubling or this echoing um, that's really really rough uh, but also just sort of compels me and I guess the last thing that I'm thinking about and thinking about the immaterial and sort of like the metaphysics of things is that um, I'm a lucid dreamer, which I don't talk about a lot publicly because I'm mad superstitious. Um, and the last time I took, there you go, I took a class about lucid dreaming uh, when I first moved to New York, like maybe two or three years in. And for several months, I couldn't lucid dream after that. I could not. And I am convinced, and I've said this in another talk, that I was being punished literally for the fact that I was trying to understand something that I need to leave alone. So when I speak about lucid dreaming, I speak about it very much in terms of like, I have these like deeply um, embodied sleeping experiences that are basically me just sort of like moving through these different worlds. And I wake up with this new set of understanding about things and none of that understanding can be categorized. And there's something very beautiful about that space of like learning and exploring and making sense and not making sense. Um, that's very joyful. And then you wake up and people, and then you re recognize that you literally have to categorize, organize, uh, assign meaning to things that you just don't want to. And so sort of moving between those worlds for me is sort of this moment of thinking about maybe there should not be an ecology between these two contexts because putting them in relation to one another actually forces me to do something with that experience uh, that disrupts it a lot. So I think I think a lot about many things being connection, Alexa Pauling Gums, Kendra Beyond Taxonomy, but then there's other element like maybe I just don't want my dreams to be part of this waking world because I know they will be corrupted in some type of way. Yeah, thank you for that. That um, uh, I think that also leads to something I kind of mentioned beforehand before we started around question of representation, which um, I'm kind of lead you guys into. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit about that experience of lucid dreaming, but also in relation to hauntings and and what Sasha mentioned with like looking at uh, the photographs of Sean, but also Sean looking at photographs of, of Sasha's work. Um, around a lot of the work I do, not just as a scholar, but as an artist with archives. Um, and I know that's really, you know, that's that's a whole thing right now. Everyone's like archive, uh, you know, it's the archive, yada, 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 okay. Um, and, and a lot of it's good work there, but um, I this was years ago, I was studying the Camille Billups archive uh, down in Atlanta. This is like five years ago. And I, you know, I totally went in very much like, oh, I'm gonna mm, do my little archi uh, archival, you know, extraction and whatnot. And I had a complete, like, I don't, I still don't know how to categorize and I've actually just looked at that, but I was, I was sick the entire time. Like I was constantly vomiting and it wasn't like, you know, food poisoning, wasn't the flu or anything. It was like, every time I set foot to do like, look at her archives, I just got sick. And I, I took a bunch of notes and kind of pushed through it. And then I sat on it for years and I'm still sitting on that work. And I don't re like, I know I kind of want to do something big with it, but I'm also just letting it be. And I, I had to kind of come to terms with the fact that sometimes, and this is what kind of led me back to the, the comment I met on fugitivity and the spy, uh, if, if we want to come back to that. But like, so sometimes a lot of the ways in which our ancestors are kind of our main points of figures in the past have had to elude uh, representation, right? Because literally to be represented, to be identified, could risk the threat, uh, the threat of death, right? Uh, so they developed all these ways of, of kind of existing um, just beneath the surface. Um, and here I am going to that archive being like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make you known, right? Like, I'm gonna write about you. Everyone's gonna know about this. Uh, when they're kind of like, no, <laughs> that's, that's not the point, right? Like, you know, there's a way to talk about it potentially, maybe there's a language available, but that, that type of work that I wanted to do is, is not what they wanted, right? Um, and, and I think about why I, I've shifted away from fugitivity to like the spy figure, because I, I, I don't think fugitivity grants a lot of agency around what that experience did for me, right? That those are long did objects in quotation marks. Um, and and they're, they're doing something still, they're still active in a way that 
that is purposely existing within these spaces um, just beneath the surface with their own potential, right? And, and just how that cannot necessarily be quantified uh, through, through text, through language, through, through discourse in that respect. It just becomes a, a, an interpretive feeling uh, that changes you though, that still has a certain amount of power uh, as well. Uh, and it doesn't make it any less impactful. It's just different in its effect. Um, and, and I think for me, that's where a lot of your guys' work just is not within the category of representation. Um, and I know there's so many ways in which people talk about representation. Um, and that's not what I'm even gesturing to. I literally mean it, mean it in its Webster dictionary term symbols representing or standing in for something else, right? But so much of what we've talked about thus far is about exceeding that, right? Familiarity, right? Haunting, just kind of giving off a vibe, right? Around, oh, this reminds me of this and letting it be that. Uh, and I just wanna know if any of you guys can say more uh, about that and or I'm happy to open the conversation to what you guys think about moving away or moving within fugitivity, if that's something of interest. Um, I, I, I feel like I, I don't have a complete answer. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> I, I am, I'm, I'm like thinking through the idea of the spy and I, and I, I'm, I'm like, I'm, I feel like I'm definitely something I'm like, I'm, I'm carrying with me or will be carrying with me after this conversation. And, and I'm, even in the sort of, spaces or encounters with um like mm, i'm like how tight <laughs> this do i need to be with my words uh, but I'm, I'm like i'm wanting i'm like i'm just hesitant of like fugitivity because i know that that's not my condition you know and and i know that that like like it is like it was a condition of my ancestors and I'm, and I'm not, I'm, I'm just not running in the same way. It is kind of the, my like, e even in that sort of like metaphorical space, I'm just like, oh, I can't really play with that word. You know, like it, it, it feels really like big in a way that I just can't play with it, you know? Um, and, 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 and that's also not to say that our like, conditions aren't big, you know, um, but it, 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 it's, it's, it's just, I, I just don't know for me personally, if, if like, it's the word I can use. And so I'm, I'm drawn to the spy. Um, um, and, and, and a sort of like term or phrase that I have kind of been playing with over the, the last couple of years is, is, is black secrecy and this kind of like, um, and actually, I think I think about you all the time, Camila, in this conversation with you and John Edmonds, I think it was, for Paper Journal. Um, and and you you sort of have a, a black secrecy moment. And um, and then you also kind of bring it back to Harriet Mullen, which I think is like, like, yes, uh, you know, but, it, you know, it's just this kind of like how we like are like speaking in public and also in, in highly specific ways that like only we can get and like, and the we isn't like hidden in an academy. It's actually like, I can I can and do speak this way with my mom. You know what I mean? Like the, this like, it's, it's, it's a very like, I don't know, the, the sort of, it's, it's anti-hierarchical, you know? And, and it's, and it's, it's specific and it's broad. Um, and it's like, it, it lives in like, body language you know what i mean like i um i was I was writing about um a performance by nick k um where the term was sort of like coming to be and um and and, and obviously i'm not the only one who's you know I, I think the thing about black secrecy is that actually everyone has a version of it or like a, 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 a like set of terms that like points you know, in, in this way and, and, and points against it too, you know, because I think it's it's inherently deflecting, you know, um, even if as it's defining itself, it's like um, shrouding itself further. So only black people get it, you know, um, and, um, and, I, and, and yeah, and, I, and I'm thinking like, 
um, yeah, there's a way that that like takes shape sort of like embedded into the practice, but then also embedded into like our positionalities in which we're like, yeah, making work in a kind of public, you know, but like actually further making it specific who the public is. Um, yeah. Okay. That's, that's what I have right now. <laughs> yeah, that's, um, I mean, I, I, I guess this is like, uh, yeah, I'm thinking a lot about what you just said about fugitivity. Uh, uh, so I'm glad you brought that up because I, I'm thinking a lot about it um, in terms of agency, in terms of like what conditions we claim and which conditions we don't claim. Um, and I guess almost like sometimes like the failure of metaphor and analogy and just like um, language that's designed to create understanding by building a relationship to something else that's familiar, even if that relationship that you're building to something familiar is not the thing you're talking about, it's just the reference point. And there is this um, really interesting conversation that, or lecture that Fred uh, Wooderson III gives at Omni Commons, I'm bringing it up because of fugitivity and Black Afro-pessimism, and Afro -pessimism, um, but there's one part that I play a lot when I give talks, um, and it's this part where he speaks about uh, the ruse and danger of analogy. Um, and I had written something about analogy before that. And when I saw that, I was like, oh, yeah, that's why I hate it also. But he was basically speaking about the ways in which analogy obscures and like, it, say what you mean, say what you mean, right? Like, if you're saying that, like, it sucks to work um, these hours, it's not a slave job. It just sucks to work those hours. So like being very mindful of our language and um, it was sort of this moment for me of like the ways in which we create understanding and talk about things is also is always comparative. But we never just talk about things without using comparative language or associative language. And so sort of the dangers and pitfalls of that. And so I don't know, Sean, you said something around like, uh, I wrote it down because I'm going to email you later and be like, I need the direct quote about this. But you talked about this notion of defining and deflecting simultaneously, which I thought was like a really beautiful way to phrase that moment of like, doing a thing, um, but it also made me think about the we um, and like the we within black communities because not everyone is part of my we um, and not everyone is part of your we and there are things about uh, different communities that I'm not part of that I don't, I should not have access to, right? Um, I should not be able to like, be part of those conversations unless I'm invited. I'm not a trans person, I'm not a black trans person. I don't get to be invited into those conversations um, just by nature, by, by virtue of being black, right? Um, and I don't get to participate in, in those types of uh, exchanges of, of secrecy just by virtue of being black. And so I think also sort of thinking about who are we saying is part of the we um, and how that can get messy. But I think that messiness is actually useful because I think so many times we do the like, but we're all black, but I'm like, you don't understand that experiences, you weren't there. You were kind of like over there on the other side of the park, but you weren't like at this particular part in the park. So like, there's a different sort of subject position you're coming from. Um, I guess the last thing I'll say just like regarding like representation and secrecy, it's like, I remember my husband and I went to the National, uh, the New African American Museum and there's a part of the museum that has like, uh, like black, um, uh, sort of references to black language uh, and like um, body language and things like that. And we were laughing. He's like, yo, they out here giving out all the secrets. Like they tell me what a handshake means. And so we were just like laughing, like, why would they do this? They're giving, and then I, I remember, we had a conversation later, which is like to Sean's point around these moments of like defining something we're also deflecting at the same time. So there's this moment of defining where everything becomes super lucid and clear, but at the same time we're deflecting because this is just like one person's handshake from like the top part of California. We got like 50,000 of them and we just showed you one. Um, and so I think that there's the we that's like based upon like many different intersecting personalities, but there's also deep regional realities. I'm from Northern California, Bay Area, but not San Francisco, Oakland. I'm from East Palo Alto, which is in the peninsula, which is a very specific experience on a lonely land. Like that's very different than Oakland and San Francisco. So I, 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 I am very interested in hyper-local, hyper-regional we's when we talk about Black folks, which I don't think uh, corrupts a notion of Black community, but I think it adds nuance and layers and actually gives us greater access to understanding our multiplicity versus this sort of homogenous like 
we're all talking and we all get it. Cause sometimes I don't really know what people say. So, you know, I, I don't want to be scared to say, I don't know. <laughs> no, I think, sorry. Um, I've been thinking about this very recently as well about um, how do I, how do we think through the, the speci specificity in order to understand something larger about the group, but to then, then come back down to the local. Because I think that um, there's too often the, the local and then, the, sorry, the, the larger and then, and then local. But I think there is something to be said for us to, of, for us to remember the specificities of where we are, because then that will help us understand the specificities of black people as a whole, because everybody's different. Like we, we say it all the time, like black people are not a monolith, black people are mono, not a monolith, but we like really need to, like really need to come to terms with what that means, that we are not a monolith. That means that there's gonna be divergent thought, divergent choice, divergent ways of being. And this includes like, um, like I can't, like how you were saying, like, I can't and should not be the person that is speaking for a Black trans experience. There is somebody that is doing that, and you need to go look at them. <laughs> I'm not the one. But as I think that um, Black voices get mainstreamed, what ends up happening is it gets diluted down just for the sake of understanding and I think that that's something that I've been trying, that I've been dealing with myself. Like, what does it mean as we move from the margins to the center? What does that mean for us as Black people in America? And that, and that is, yeah, I don't know. And, and then, and I think, so I want to talk about the book because I, I like, Sean, you, you grew up in, where did you grow up? Sorry, if you don't have to answer that question if you don't want to, but, yeah. but I'll actually be specific about what I want to say more specifically is that I was very struck. I didn't read, I looked at all the photos, but I didn't read all the poetry. But what, what I was like struck by with the poetry was like this like dense, like we're talking about ecologies, but now I'm like ecology. I'm like, this is about, this is about being outside and staring at flowers. This is about like, dirt and like cobwebs and shit like that and so I'm like curious what I like what I think I like about this book what, what I do like about this book is that um is the way that you like bring us to nature back to nature in this way that is purely about nature because something that I, that I do think about a lot is like what was it like? I think about this with my parents more specifically, like what the hell was it like when my mom first saw snow? What the hell was it like when like they first brought, you know, African people to, you know, they came in August and then all of a sudden it was July, like, no, sorry, all of a sudden it was November. Like, what the fuck was that like? What did that do to a group of people to like have to experience weather, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, uh, I, I, and there's two things that um, I wanted to, uh, b before I answer your question, I, I think um, uh, you, in, in sort of like, yeah, speaking about the way that like, um, sort of like one gets chosen, like I think that actually is like one of the problems of representation, you know, is that mm -hmm. it's actually, it's, it's about creating a one or like a, a like mold in which like, every black person falls under and every like black woman falls under and by every black trans person, you know, and then it's just like, this is, this is what they all do. This is what they're all like, you know, because we have one who said this, you know, and that's kind of like, and I, yeah, and I think that's, it's just boring. It's just, you know, yeah. I mean, like it's, it's flawed, but it's also just like literally boring. <laughs> um, uh, and then the, yeah, I, I, I uh, was born in Brooklyn, raised in Miami. Um, and and yeah, the, I think that there's an element of wild peach that's like, um, it's also, it's like, it's it's kind of about all the other places, like all the couches I've slept on also, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? It's, it's like, it's, 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 it's a bit of like, a, yeah, like of a, of a road trip in a way. Um, and, and yeah, it, it, there's this like, you know, in, in, 
in sort of the short chapter of it's of like where because I sorry I'm, I'm I guess what I'm trying to say is like um even in its sort of like invention I I, I think the sort of like and, and 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 also going back to Camila and haunting like I think like like the the place of where where the work sort of comes to be like you know like a, even if 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 a photograph of a shore is not the about the literal shore that it's on but it's um it's kind of this like this greater idea of shores and arrivals and departures um i that's not divorced from this is in lisbon and i am in lisbon and like what is lisbon's history in mm -hmm. uh, or, or portugal's history in relationship to this project, this wandering, our colonial histories, you know, or, or past and so on and so forth, you know? And so there's like, um, it, both things are happening where it's like, mm -hmm. I'm in Miami and I'm in Brooklyn and I'm upstate and I'm in Utah and I'm in Portugal and I'm in London, you know, like it, it, it's like, it's all kind of like speaking to each other in, in a way, yeah. This, um... I'm enjoying talking to you all so much. Um, it makes me, I, I, I was like, oh yes, we were talking about the book. <laughs> that I forgot Wait, but I also want to talk about y'all's book. Like, uh, yeah, like, please, like, no new theories, untitled, like. No, 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 yeah. I, I want to talk about, you. that's that's why we're here. Yeah, me too. I actually, uh, I, I am more excited when I get invited to talk to people about other things than myself. Like, I, <laughs> I'm just like, I, I, I've done myself, like, I'm, I'm good. Um, <laughs> I, I think that was interesting to me about Wild Peach is the way in which it invites multiple reads and they feel like portals. So this notion of, I think around flattened representation is that there it's not a portal. You're just like looking at like a 2D figure, right? And then it's done, it's over. There's no other place you can go. There's sort of like a resistance to moving in and out or a lenticularity or, or any type of multiple reads. And so when I think about your work, Sean, I think there's an element of like, well, I get to sort of move between multiple worlds, but also the first time that I read something and have an impression is actually not the only impression that's possible. And I like the feeling of being able to read a sentence and then being like, oh, blah, 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 and then coming back and being like, nah, never mind, just kidding. And so I think that that sort of uh, mm -hmm. element of secrecy or sort of like, move, and, and, and taking into consideration your, um, hesitance around fugitivity in this way there's almost like a playful uh there's a play with the reader in the sense that you sort of like walk towards us and you walk back and you walk towards us get really really close and you might like kiss us on the forehead and then like run away again and so there's something really beautiful about feeling like you thought about us as readers even in just like in the sequencing of the images and sort of, sort of interspersing the text that feels important and thinking about processes of black production that take in consideration different ways of engaging with an experience and knowing that with a book I can I can sit on my bed with a book I can like take to my I can do whatever I want with the book it is a very intimate and personal um experience and so I think like even the size of the book itself um yeah it yeah like it literally and figuratively unfolds and so I, I yeah that's all I'm done gushing. I'll have more to say in a moment. <laughs> wow, that really means a lot. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm really just taking it back. Thank you. I mean, yeah, I, I'm honestly still in a place of like, wow, people um, have read it. Like, you know, like, I'm still, yeah. So thank you. That really means a lot. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, adding to that, uh, I kind of want to ask a technical question, right? Uh, as you... Well, you're a photographer uh, and also just thinking of links here. Um, what was the correlation for you in assigning, right? Some those images with not only the process like film, literally you're talking about working with negatives and uh, producing that, but then also assigning it next to those texts. Uh, and how was, how was some of that spontaneous, right? We know how as someone who works with film, things happen, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. with your hair falling into the frame, right? Um, and, and how much of that uh, had more of an organic kind of vibe to it, right? Yeah. I, um, some of, I mean, you know, I, well, I'll, there's sort of two, I, I like printed out every poem and every 
even just like blank page of the book um like when i was laying it out um uh body text the last section comes first and so th that was my first chat book um and actually in a way this goes back to your question on waywardness in which some of that work or not not the work it's but some of the processes so the the photograms um i actually started making in undergrad and um just didn't really like no one was responding to that work or the poetic work and um or the poetry rather and um and in fact there's just sort of like i was constantly being encouraged to just like just make photographs um and and like you know the rest is history <laughs> um uh and and then so the, the, there's body text is sort of like a re-envisioning um and an expansion on that first chapbook um um like the color photographs are all new editions and for me that section is kind of a uh like it we've spent like the rest of the book in a kind of outdoors and like ultra personal engagement and then like body text is just kind of like wandering back inside in a way um or um and so, yeah and, and 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 so that's kind of the like thematics of the photographs in a way um you know the photograms are, are like um some were literally made at home and, and but they were kind of like the accumulation of like the hair happens at home um and then uh you know, again, the, the, the sort of photographs are also in, a, in an interior mostly. Um, the, and then, yeah, going back to the first two sections, there's, um, I'm thinking about like the, the, there's definitely like sort of like a, the, you know, an intention about like the mist that you enter with that first photograph of the, the fog. And it's, it's like, it is just, okay, like you've entered the book now, like this is now the, the world, this is now like the veil that you're kind of like, having to like get into to get into wild peach um um and so yeah some of those things are like a little bit instructive in terms of like a reading and then um some of them are you know like uh, there's the, the the section of there's like th i, I want to say there's like three or four four photographs in um in all ge in all of geometry and mornings um that are kind of I feel like if anything, that's like the, the sort of like clearest sort of sequence of the photographs themselves, um, the speaking to themselves. Um, and there's like echoes of them across the poems, but they're not like none of the poems are about those photographs. And like actually those, yeah, those photographs kind of like have to kind of like, they, they, they create like a, a rhythm themselves for themselves. Um, and so it's a, it's own, it's its own like mini suite or something, you know? Um, yeah, and so yeah, the the relationships are 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 in that they're not representative uh, or representational. Um, a lot of it is a kind of about like a sonics or like a cover a color movement, um, uh, um, and then also just sort of this like bookmark of like shores and landscapes in between. Yeah. <laughs> No, it's really great. Um, so we have, I think, maybe like one more kind of question we'll wrap. Uh, I want to be mindful of everyone's time. Uh, but I think also in kind of jumping off of uh, Wild Peach, but also the conclusion of your show and all of ge uh, Geometry and Mornings, um, I, I want to bring us back to a topic we begin with, and not just with waywardness, right? Um, but I, I want to bring us back to this perception of time because uh, time moves differently in your book. I know when I was reading it, uh, it, it reminded me of like, it reminded me, I hate to say memory because I know everyone likes to use memory, but, um, but fragments, right? Like sequences uh, rather than- uh, <laughs> Wait, you have it, Sasha? What? Sasha? Uh, oh no. She I think she just froze as she, no. she, like, she <laughs> I think she'll come back at the beginning she froze a little bit but then it it snapped okay. back so Sorry. uh yeah <laughs> but it reminded me of sequences right mm -hmm. like uh non-complete uh narratives like and what I mean by that is like I, I couldn't get a sense of like beginning middle and the end but mm -hmm. I, I got a sense of like feeling through just like 
waking up or, or being in a place or being in relationship with uh, something. Uh, and, and just how that's, that's already a kind of way of, of categorizing or, or thinking of time differently, right? Rather than something of like, I have a complete uh, structure here. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think that fragmentation was really, not only is it like, you know, effectively moving, right? It's beautiful work, you do beautiful work. And, and I mean that in the highest sense of, there's an affection of beauty that comes out of it, right? Um, and I think about what Sasha said, it's like, it's dirt, <laughs> it's like mm -hmm. it's the beach, right? Like these are these are things that they're rendered uh, very, very movingly, um, but they're also intimately connected right with time of like, how do we process that? How do you, how do you return to time um, mm -hmm. and not try to contain it? And uh, I wanna know if you can speak more about that uh, across your show and the book and uh, if anyone else had any final kind of relationships with that. And I'm critically, I'm thinking of Camila, right? And, uh, you know, going back to your work on physics, kind of rethinking of a circle, right? Mm -hmm. um, and how that is already an, a kind of counter engagement with the, the, the linear perceptions of time that we're, we're literally taught in school, right? Or even I'm thinking of Sasha's uh, photographic practices, I, specifically, if you want to say more about the black and white work you do, and how often when we talk about photography, black and white gets lodged as being like the past, right? As a kind of otherness, but how you, you retain that and make it very, very much. And then Sean, you mentioned this, it's here and it's there at the same time. It's here in the past at the same time um, of, of your work. Um, so there's just final points available. Yeah. If any, actually, if anyone else wants to start, feel free, um, yeah. I'm, I feel like I'm still, even though it was, I know, kind of directed at me, but I'm, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm still chewing it. Um, hmm. I was trying to find uh, some notes and I realized, we're in Philadelphia now, I realized I didn't bring the right notebook that has notes, I know we've all been there. Um, but the note I was looking for was for this poetry reading that I did at Nottingham Contemporary. And one of the poets, um, maybe it was Jesse Darling that said this, uh, they were talking about their freedom of poetry and that you don't actually have to like follow time. So if I write a novel, I have to like, I think there's, this is, I'm, I'm quoting or paraphrasing their, their brilliance. They were saying something to the effect of like, when you write a novel, you have to actually like account for the beginning, middle and end. You just can't be like, and at 70, like there's some like a sentence, something has to happen, right? And they were talking about poetry as giving the sort of freedom to, to sort of play with time and that you can sort of start in the middle of a moment or like a second could be expanded over 16 pages. Um, and so I, I, I wonder, I, I've been thinking about time in relation to forms and like the affordances of different modes of, of, of creating, right? Like what does a painting afford that a poem does not? And what does a poem afford that like a novel does not? And so that's been a lot of my thinking around time, but I also say that as much as I want to trouble time, there is something about the urgency of needing people to do certain type of work now, like tomorrow, like yesterday, uh, that uh, sort of throws my theoretical attraction to non-linearity out the window. So like, I may be non-linear in the way that it makes sense to the world, but, but my linear um, desire is that by tomorrow, we all have affordable housing, right? Mm -hmm. And there's something that's so interesting to me about like the ways in which non-linearity gets um, instrumentalized and weaponized when people don't want to do the work they need to do. Um, and, and so I, I'm, I'm constantly trying to like, figure out my home within that language because I don't, in the most crass terms, don't wanna let people off the hook by being like, you get there when you get there. Like, no, I need to stop being terrible now. Uh, so yeah, I, that, I think that's part of my thinking around time at this moment. Mm -hmm. To a degree, I also, I still feel like that even goes, like I feel like that goes against it because I often think of time of like, I'm providing justice for like something that should have happened yesterday. Right, like I'm going back to the past to provide justice to to someone who died or to something that should have been done, uh, and it's still kind of bucking up against that. Uh, but I completely agree with you. Like, if we're <laughs> to maybe throw that vocabulary out when it's like, oh, I'm I'm gonna do, but no, just do it, <laughs> like do it. 
Yeah, I definitely, and I, yeah, that's, yeah, no, I, I definitely agree with that, where it's like, oh, this is serving something beyond me. And I think a lot about, you know, Gabrie- Gabrielle Octavia Rucker and then the way that she writes and and framing it as like, oh, I actually like, this won't, This doesn't matter in this lifetime. Like it's for the like, whoever digs up our society later, you know? Um, and I don't know, if, I don't think that's where I am exactly, but I, I'm, if anything, I'm in between <laughs> like, yeah trying to like honor a past and like and maybe even like for the being dug up like um provide a like oh this was a kind of honoring that was available um you know um or that was happening I'm also thinking about like the the time like I think the thing about the mediums of poetry and photography are that like time is it's it's kind of like it's 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 like fucked on so many levels because it's like okay well the exposure is a sixtieth of a second but like it took me an hour to frame uh, and it took me four hours to edit um, and I printed it fourteen hundred times and you know what I mean like there's just so many like <laughs> uh, like units of time that like aren't accounted for in revision in like the actual sort of like before and after of um of like the thing's life um and and i think like i'm actually like trying to account for that in the process of making um um yeah where 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 some things come quite quickly but then are like you know belabored later or they're or they like are belabored in their making and like i can't look at them again you know it's like i know it's a little bit magenta but actually like that's just how it lives now like i just actually like it just doesn't, it won't make more sense, um, in any other way. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's, it, it, it's like, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to account for the time that we can't, can't account for. <laughs> yeah. So I think that I, um, perhaps use black and white photography in a similar manner, because in the way that we're talking about time, in the sense that black and white photography is a timeless, timeless because of its, historical implications as being the first uh, photographic way that things were seen. But then also it's kind of like, it's timeless in that sense, but then also it asks the question, I hope, or what I'm interested in is like, if you're looking at these black and white photos, images of black people today, and we're still having the same conversation, there's a problem. And so like, if you like um, can see the work and use, and use like, I. I think I'm interested in using the anteriority of the medium itself to ask a question now. That's that there's a big difference between what I do and activism, because I think that what I do is I'm interested in photographs. I'm not, I would not call myself an activist, but I need, I think that there's also the other layer in making the work in which you have to live the now, which is like, this is a shitty person doing a shitty thing. And how do we get these people out of here so that we can get affordable how to, or whatever, however the many different ways that you want to think about that. And so I think that um, the art itself is a part of a, a larger conversation that's happening artistically, but also like, I hate to say in the real world, but you know what I'm saying? On the ground mm-hmm. of like, how do, we, how do we move this thing from here to here? So that when you look at these images, when you dig them up, you know, 300 years from now, that we're not having the same conversation anymore. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. Um, so that's a just got word, you know, a final kind of call. Uh, so I just want to extend my um, uh, gratitude uh, for being invited uh, to hold space with the three of you and your brilliant work and independent practices. Um, as well as uh, just to continue to uplift uh, Sean's work, your wonderful exhibition, uh, which closes today at White Columns, and uh, that formidable, uh, I think, it, and I use beautiful, and it, it's just, it really is a beautiful, beautiful work, right? Um, and I think uh, it reminds me of the argument uh, that I think David Von Rovich kind of called for, you know, in the early 1990s when someone looked at his work and it was like, why is it beautiful? You know, it's like HIV AIDS is going on. He's like, well, we need to fight for for this beauty. 
Um, and that's what I'm drawn to and in, in holding space for that um, amongst all these other narratives. So with that, uh, thank you all. Um, I'm gonna pass it back over to Brittany. Thank you so much, Diana. Um, yeah, wow. Nice talk. Uh, guys, just thank you um, for the gift of this conversation. Um, this is obviously something that's going to be on our website under Sean's exhibition page, but the context of this conversation and the context of this exhibition has been to say the least, just a gift. So thank you to Sean. And thank you for everybody who joined us tonight. Thank you again to Ayana, Camille, and Sasha for taking the time to share your work and your thoughts with us this evening. Again, as Ayana stated, um, the exhibition closed today, and this is the final installment in the series of readings and conversations that have taken place um, throughout the duration of Shandi Henry Smith's exhibition in all geometry and mornings. So thank you to everyone who's tuned in with us throughout <clears throat> this series. And to Sean, congratulations again, once more on such a thoughtful, 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 thoughtful exhibition. And just like a very thoughtful run, uh, the programming and context of your exhibition has made space for <clears throat> conversations, introspection, sensitivity. Um, and like I said, it's just been a gift. So from myself and, and the entire Wycombs team, thank you. And we wish you all the best in Amsterdam and onwards. And to all of our attendees and participants, again, thank you for tuning in and have a wonderful evening. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Good night. Thank you.